Seems like maybe not. All right, so I'm Andy Gospodark. Uh, we'll talk today a little bit about uh, what it's like to work at a, at a hardware vendor, a uh, networking hardware vendor, and uh, you know, sort of tagline here of keeping up with the Joneses. Um, I think that's uh, probably a great description of what it's like to be there sometimes. Um, so I work for Broadcom, and I work in what's called the Compute and Connectivity Division, or CCX. Um, so I realized after I submitted this talk and it was accepted, uh, thanks to the, the team that reviewed this, that um, I should probably start this off by explaining what keeping up with the Joneses means, because it's probably a fairly uh, American phrase, um, or maybe just English speaking. But basically, the, the notion is that you're spending a lot of your time uh, comparing yourself to your neighbors, uh, and in the case, probably in the in the excessive consumption uh, uh, culture that we live in the United States sometimes, the idea of, you know, oh, well, my neighbor has a good car, I gotta have a good car. My neighbor has a nice lawn, I gotta do that. So you're constantly spending your time trying to keep up with them. So in the same kind of context for networking, the idea is that, well, my hardware is just as good as someone else's hardware, or my driver is just as good as someone else's driver, or whatever. And every time a new piece of technology comes out, you know, we just spent 90 minutes hearing about uh, XTP and it is a great talk, but it's like you, you start to realize there are a lot of things that are going to require like a tightly coupled integration between not only the kernel stack and, and, and uh, BPF calls, but ultimately drivers as well. So, so I think that kind of summarizes it up. So, so hopefully that's, that's now clear to those that didn't know it. Um, so as you might expect, Broadcom makes lots of different networking hardware. So... Uh, this talk is not about wireless, so if you want to <laughs> get mad, you can. Um, and, I, and I know that Broadcom Wireless is at times, uh, for this community, uh, a troubling uh, situation. Uh, so I like to pass the buck and say I don't work for that division. Um, so uh, apologies uh, to those that do work for the division that may be watching this later on YouTube. Um, also, this talk is not about switching hardware. Um, I also don't work for that division, so lucky me. Um, although they make some killer products, uh, they're um, also uh, not quite in the same space in terms of having a kernel driver to support the offload of switching and uh, routing. So not about that. Uh, you can feel free to pepper me with questions, but I would just say I don't work in that division. Um, so we're going to talk about NIC hardware today, um, or as some might say, we just end up talking about controller hardware. That's one of the things used most commonly internally. So we're going to touch, touch on those issues and all the things we keep up with. So unsurprisingly, our goal is to sell as many NICs as possible. And uh, that's mostly so I can stay gainfully employed. Um, and all the other people in my division. But this is not common. This is the case for every single vendor. They want to sell as many as possible, uh, unless they have some crazy, crazy wish. So. Um, and I think the key is that if you want to sell the most hardware, you might, might need to build the best hardware. Uh, might and best both in italics because those are pretty important <laughs> phrases, I think, in this sentence. Um, best has a variety of meanings, so we'll talk about that. Let's, let's define it. So all right, just to get people moving, because I'm sure we're you know, halfway through the conference or not quite, and people are, as Dave mentioned earlier, probably feeling good from yesterday evening. Um, so let's define best. All right, so I'm going to make people like, I won't make you stand up, I'm going to make you show your hands just for fun. So would having, be able to, you know, pass the most number of packets per second, would that be an important decision for you if you were buying? <laughs> okay, for some people. There we go. All right, good, good. Some participation. All right, how about lowest power consumption? Anyone care about power? <laughs> not really, right? Maybe? No. Who cares? We got lots of power in the data center. It's not even the most expensive thing there, is it? All right, uh, lowest price. Who cares about price? Anybody care about price? No, we got tons of money. No, okay, all right. Or, or you just get them free from, from people all the time so you don't care about cost. That's right, exactly. How um, much does it cost? The, yeah, the advantage of the OS, the OS vendors. Um, all right, what about the most offloads? Who would care about lots of offloads? Maybe? Maybe a couple hands? Okay, all right, Dave cares. That's good. What about least offloads? Who would want the least <laughs> offloads? Okay, it, this is, strangely enough, this is a pretty important thing that people care about. I don't want to pay for things I'm not using. <laughs> Everyone's Mies van der Rohe less is more. <laughs> That's right. So, and then, uh, if those of you that have seen me uh, speak at any conference lately, you'll know I'm big on this whole smart NIC concept and the idea of having some ARM cores on your NIC to do cool things. At least I think they're cool. So what about the most ARM or maybe even RISC-V cores? Who cares about that? You know, the guy that works for ARM cares. Um, <laughs> 
So then we've got even, what about the most programmable FPGA or NPU for your super programmable data plane? I bet we've got a couple people that probably care about that. We should see it. Huh? Does it run EPF? It could. So yeah, you should, I think a couple vendors, I should see a couple vendor hands go up. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Simon. Um, so, but you also might need to make the best firmware and drivers. And I know firmware is a bad word. Everybody say boo. Come on. Boo. If right. it's open source, it's okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that's, that's kind of crazy in this current generation of Nix, pretty much anything that's 10 gig and faster, it's all got firmware. It used to, used to be a feeling like, I think, um, yeah, kind of 10 gig and before, there maybe wasn't much firmware, or maybe in some cases none at all that, that we knew about. But everybody's got it at this point. And whether they have big, powerful ARM cores that with the, begin with an A, or some of the ones that begin with an M that are a little bit smaller, doing just a little bit of work, they've all got firmware. So it's, um, kind of a bummer. So as we sort of saw the smattering of hands was a little bit different. The challenge we have is that best is different for really almost every customer. Or in the case of a lot of people who don't know how much they cost because they don't buy them, um, any user. So, um, so that, that's, and often right as, as people who are responsible for maintaining a system that has these cards in them, uh, you might have been able to participate in the buying, but maybe not. They might have been bought for you. Um, I talk to people all the time, and I'm sure others at hardware vendors do too, that um, they're using your NIC because it came by default with whoever sells the system you bought, or you know it was the best value or whatever, but some purchasing person uh, determines what, what you get, so uh, best is different for almost everybody. So pretty factually accurate, you're sending sort of standard, regular old, non-jumbo framed MTU byte packets, 1,500 byte packets, almost any NIC that's out there can send and receive at line rate today. So whether that's 10, 25, 40, 50, or 100 gig, that's a fact, okay? So when we start to think about how many packets per second you can handle at 1,500 bytes, even 100 gigs, is not that many packets. Um, but uh, some can handle line rate at smaller packet sizes, obviously. Um, and this runs across the board. Um, I'm sure many of the other people that work hard, hardware vendors know all the numbers for their, their own cards and other people's. Um, so if you're thinking about what to buy, you might need to do something that can do line rate 64-byte packets. If that's what you need, if you're just processing ACKs or doing something like that, then you've got to find a NIC that can handle it. It's pretty important. Uh, it might fall into the category of best for you. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you don't need, let me, same time, if you don't need to process nothing but 64-byte packets. Maybe you're okay if line rate's suitable at 300 or iMix distribution of packets, uh, which is you know a couple 64s, a couple one or two big ones, and then some in the middle. I think it works out to an average of about 320. Um, so it's interesting to think about. You know, not not everything we we often deal with with. I often uh, get involved with customers who, you know, they'll, they'll come in hard and they'll say, we need to handle this many million packets per second, no questions asked. Your, your NIC hardware must be able to do it. And then you'll go to another conference or another event and someone is like really excited that with this certain piece of software on top of a NIC, they can do like six, like six gigabits. And they're just super excited. I'm like, okay, these people are the ones that we should be selling this NIC to. And the people that want to do 50 million, we sell them this other one. And so it's, it's important to think about that, that, that uh, one size doesn't fit all. All right, on the, other, on the other side, individual component costs are important. So if a NIC can do offloads, like if the NIC that Dave wants that does tons of offloads, sorry, it's not the one you want. Um, if it can offload work from server cores, then maybe you can justify a higher price for it. And I'm not saying you should charge more just because you can, but maybe it does cost a little bit more to build that NIC. And what you find when you say it justifies a higher price, because spending actually more money on that NIC might actually save you money in other places. So let's take, for example, you're able to save four cores. Well, I wasn't going to put up a chart of like Intel processor prices, but go out to arc.intel.com sometime, take a look, and look at the price difference between a NIC when you just jump by four cores, especially as you get a higher density core per socket. What you actually find is that uh, it doesn't scale linearly. So if you could find a way to buy a 16 core uh, or a, a, a yeah, 16 core socket instead of a 20 core, you'd find that you'd save some pretty significant money. And maybe that's part of your overall system design. Maybe it's not. Uh, but it's important to think about.
gets down to our price. Maybe Jesper doesn't care about price, but <laughs> it's important. All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about offloads. So fixed function devices have evolved with some pretty significant offloads over time. So we started with just checksum offload and TSO. And who remembers the... Who remembers being around long enough, or, and that's a loaded question, but you know, what was the most common thing that people would say maybe about TSO 15 years ago? What, anybody have any, what, if a call came in to support a, a device that had TSO and it wasn't working, what was almost always the, the common thing? Turn it off. Turn it off, right? I mean, I don't know how many times I feel like I either heard that advice or offered that advice. Um, and times have changed a little bit, and these aren't just the only two offloads we have now. So as we start to look at what we've scaled out to uh, in terms of hardware support and driver support to go with it, um, you know, we've got all sorts of different segmentation offload or receive offload or even hardware GRO uh, that, at least one, that at least one hardware has. UDP fragmentation offload. Now let's not to mention RSS, um, uh, uh, transmit packet steering, and receive packet steering. So we're starting to see a lot of offload a lot of assist that can be done. Now enter tunnel encapsulation and decapsulation. Hardware can also do this. So we're, we're starting to see tons of offload. Now we have flow offload, either via n-tuple filters from ETH tool or CLS flower. So OK, lots and lots of offload, saves lots of cores. And let's not forget, um, TLS offload, uh, popular now, probably even more popular as quick uh, becomes bigger, and uh, not to leave anything out but uh, XDP and uh, BPF offload that we're starting to see. So the, the explosion in hardware capabilities can, can change the way you think about how you build your systems. Not only that, my favorite, uh, control plane offload because you can just run the whole application on your NIC if you want. So again, shameless plug for things that we make. Um, so, but one of the things that we find too is that it seems extremely unlikely um, that all these offloads are being used at the same time. Uh, in fact, I would say there's almost a 0% chance, um, which kind of touches on what we talked about, what you talked about earlier. You know, it's great to be able to stack these BPF <laughs> programs together, and it's important to think about that, but they're, it's, un, it's unknown whether or not lots of folks will want to do it. I still applaud the work, and I think it's great. Um, I also think this is part of the reason that we, we, this fact exists is because uh, there's a lot of ha hardware offloaded information that isn't in the metadata of the XDP packets yet. So mm -hmm. like that, that's the, you're, you're, um, if you're using XDP, you're therefore not taking advantage of a lot of these offloaded values. That's right. That's right. And that's why the XDP folks all raised their hands when they said they wanted less, exactly. less offloads. Um, fix that. Yeah. Yeah. We will fix that. Well, and I think that, you know, looking at it, I think w looking at it holistically too, one of the hardest parts or one of the, one of the important things to do is look at what NICs can do and what they can do well. Uh, many of them can parse really well. And if the packets can come up pre-parsed and we have a way to, to look at that, have that data parsed in some way and have mm -hmm. a reusable format, I know a lot of things have been talked about. Um, you know, the XDP hint stuff that I think was talked about two years ago. And I, I think this is a really powerful potential because you have all this logic for class flower and that could pre-filter uh, packets into a specific queue and once we have per queue XDP programs, you can, yeah, this is amazing stuff you can do. Yeah, and th that's, that's one of the, that I think together, th those things put together are something that we don't look at right now as a group very much, I think because we're ultimately not the ones responsible for deploying it. And then many people don't want to look at it for deploying it either because if there's any inconsistency between, between the way vendors operate or between what vendors can parse, then they're just like, you know what's simpler? Mm -hmm. is no offload at all. It, it's almost a feature that we had class flower because it consolidated the feature set. Yeah. Um, okay, but here's like one of the hardest parts, right, is that as, as a vendor, we feel like we have to support um, as many of these offloads as quickly as, as humanly possible. Um, so as soon as one person comes out with it, I've got to keep up with the Joneses. Um, and I've got to have it. Um, and it's, it's a constant race. And that's not a bad thing because it pushes our technology along. It, it's, it, it's progress. But uh, it makes things exhausting. Um, but then we have this case where users don't want to offload anything, like we said. Uh, 
So they want the hardware to just get out of the way. I just want raw, I just want packets, I just want buffers, I don't want to do anything, stop, stop telling me any information, stop aggregating, none of that. So, you know, this brings up the case like smart NICs or dumb NICs. Now I'm not gonna click on this link now, but if you want to look at it later, there's a um, there's a, a pretty interesting uh, podcast that the uh, Snap Switch creator did where he um, really would like to see a low-cost dumb NIC built. So something with zero offload features, just give me the packets. Um, and of course, these things are available today. You, don't have, you just don't have to use the offloads that we built in. Um, do you really want a dumb NIC or do you want smart buffering infrastructure? And well, and I think that, the, yeah, the, the, it, it kind of gets <laughs> into that, like how dumb do you want it? Exactly. Um, how much do you want it to get out of the way? Right. And, and I think that that's the, that's the challenge is, is if, and, and then of course it comes down to the tree manufacturing cost. Like is anybody going to justify taking parts out of something to spin more hardware? That's unclear. Um, and I, I think a lot of those discussions may miss the point that you need packet parsing to do splitting properly and to do zero copy. And if you are interested in that kind of stuff in your dumb Nick, right. how dumb do you want the Nick to be? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how dumb we want them to be. Uh, I won't make any, any comments further than that. All right, so, um, so then we have the notion of general purpose processors uh, that exist on NICs and how, how important uh, these might be. So, like I said, you've heard me talk about this before. Uh, I think there's videos on YouTube with tens of views uh, that discuss this <laughs> um, <laughs> from previous conferences. And, uh, but this gives you a chance to have a server really inside your server, uh, which is a crazy concept. Uh, I probably should have drawn a picture for those that haven't uh, come to grips with it yet. But, um, but the idea is that you can run Linux on your NIC and Linux on your server, so sort of Linux all the way down, if you will. And, and, and the cool part about this is that you, you now gain the ability to, if you want your NIC to just get out of the way and not do any of its fancy hardware stuff, you could actually do all that fancy hardware stuff. You could do XDP. You could do it actually on the NIC itself, have that parsing done, and have the things be pre-parsed or pre-filtered without burning any x86 cores. And same thing sort of that we justify this uh, in a way. Uh, this, this product might be a little bit more expensive, as you would guess. Uh, but uh, again, look at the ability to save uh, the number of cores when you're sizing your servers. Uh, there's a it's pretty well known, um, I guess not well known enough that I can say too much, but it's pretty well known that one of the competitive advantages that some of the cloud scale folks have is that they are able to do some of this and buy uh, chips, server chips that have a lower core count, so they save a massive amount of money. Just another way that someone's doing it more efficiently than others. Um, so yeah, we can offload the control plane and the data plane to the smart NIC instead of burning server cores. Uh, just ahead of my slides, sorry about that. Uh, but it's really kind of a cool concept and I think what we're seeing more is this resonating with more and more people. I think we've, we've had a product and other products have existed and other products are coming out. I think there'll probably be three or four or five vendors um, before the end of this year that have one. And it's really resonating with a lot of people. It's very interesting and I think we'll see other uh, Lots of OSs uh, and lots of data plane software uh, pick up. So in this case, you could do, for example, uh, FRR, free range routing. You could run it right on the NIC. So if you want to do routing all the way to your host, you could do it there. You don't have to think about running this daemon on your server, uh, which means you could install any OS you want on the server. If you wanted to run Open vSwitch all the way on the NIC, uh, given talks on that uh, and its uh, value by saving cores. Or you want to do XDP and have the BPF maps available directly to the application on the NIC and do all the forwarding right there. Also a good option. Um, hmm? Right, so yeah, so yeah, so then you can start to combine them and you can do all of that. So your route table is populated by a routing daemon. You can do, you could do some of the L3 forward routing stuff uh, and do XDP right on the NIC and really pretty uh, amazing and cool stuff. Um, all right, so speaking of programmable data planes, um, now let's talk about FPGAs and NPUs. So we talked about fixed function devices and all the things they can offload. These are great, but it's really tough when a new protocol comes out or a new frame format comes out and I've got a fixed function device that can no longer offload it. So now all of a sudden I've sized my server for something and I'm gonna burn extra cores processing those packets. So FPGAs and NPUs can both help fill the, the gap there because they are so programmable. 
So there are NPUs out there that are on NICs that offload you know, P4 or XDP or BPF, that, that data plane right on the NIC, so you don't have to think about it at all. So that's pretty cool. Uh, additionally, FPGAs can do anything. Um, it's kind of a, it's a true statement, but it's just a small matter of programming to get it done, uh, which is something that, good, a couple chuckles, that, that, that nobody should overlook because it's a huge effort. And it really right now only functions at very, very high scale. Uh, if you're buying a lot, you can afford to invest a couple people to write the Verilog to do it. It's extremely tough to justify the development cost, not, <coughs> let's forget the hardware cost, um, which is significant as well. Uh, you have to you justify that development cost, and that's, that can be tough. Unless you can get your hardware vendor or your operating system vendor to do it for you. There were some pretty interesting talks. Uh, this year, uh, I think Uli is leading some efforts to try and have a, um, a FPGA framework available uh, that could be generic and open source, and that has a lot of potential. There are no data plane apps written that I know of yet, uh, but I think that teams are starting to sort of break through and, and crack that, that nut, if you will. All right, so now we got our, our favorite one, the best firmware. Everybody's favorite. Everybody loves firmware. I wish, I wish Jerry was here, but um, uh, so the, the difficult part for any firmware is that a lot of hardware features are enabled by firmware, and this is kind of a bummer. Um, having been on the side now internally where I see how firmware is developed, you sort of understand why, uh, and, and, and what you see is that when you're bringing up a, a new system by default, there's, there's no way you're going to be able to support absolutely everything that's there. Um, and the problem now is that firmware versioning and the capabilities that really has a positive or mostly at times negative impact on user experience when you have old firmware. If we can't guarantee that a card as it leaves the factory is the version of firmware that you want or if you buy from a couple different vendors and you end up, uh, you know, system vendors and you end up with a, a mix of firmware across boards, now you're left with a, a situation where you have to upgrade some of them or suddenly some of the features you expect to work don't work. Um, maybe, they're silent, maybe, they, maybe the system silently just trolls on and, and you don't notice, uh, except for the fact that some versions are much more heavily utilized uh, CPU-wise. So that's really, that's kind of a bummer. Um, and even if it's open source, uh, which there are uh, a couple now, or at least one that's that way, uh, it can still feel a little bit like a black box. Like the lift to start to understand what firmware is doing is, um, is non-trivial. Um, we have a team that works on firmware uh, in my office uh, on a 200 gig NIC, and it takes some time to bring people up to speed, even people that are experienced uh, developers. So uh, even if that was all open source today, yes, it gives you the security or the peace of mind that you can audit it, but it's still, it's, it's, it's not trivial to get going with that. All right, now, so here's the, the fun part. Uh, so what makes a driver the best? The best. Let's think about that. All right, so to a lot of people, upstream is all that matters. That's kind of in this community. That's what we hear all the time. If it's not upstream, I, I think I have probably been quoted with saying upstream or die, um, which is maybe a little bit severe. But, uh, but I think that's true, and that's, it, it's the way that you want to get your code used by as many people as possible. It's the way to get other people to develop on your code. So in this case, Truly, upstream is all that matters. If you could see the sarcasm in my face, it was, that was the intent. Now, there's other people, inbox is all that matters. So inbox in a distribution or inbox in an OS, whether it's a Linux distribution or uh, Windows or VMware or anything, inbox is all that matters. They don't care if it's upstream, they just want to make it, make it usable so when they get their OS and install it on their server, it's there. We hear this a lot. We hear this from customers, we hear this from Everybody. But the fact is that out of tree drivers are not going away. Uh, I used to feel like it was my mission to get rid of them, uh, and I tried hard, but they're just not. And that is a bummer, but it is the case. So but these, are, these are all three sort of contradictory statements in a lot of ways. You know, upstream or die, got to be inbox, inbox or die maybe, and then um, if we keep the die theme, the out of tree drivers are not going to die. So um, I'm not sure how we're going to deal with that, but it's true. 
Hopefully I'm starting to paint a picture for you for some of the fun that it can be to work for a hardware vendor. Um, so then the question is, what does your driver support? All right, well, your driver better support all of your hardware supports. So I actually condensed all those into this slide. So it's the same one. So does your driver support all this? You know, it's, it's kind of staggering to sit back and think about how many of these things we now support when only maybe 10 years ago, maybe the first three were the only ones there, or maybe one, two, and four. Uh, so we've really grown in scope and grown in capabilities and grown in hardware uh, and kernel and driver uh, infrastructure over the time over time. So that's really important. Got to support what your hardware can support. And let's not forget, we're all working. All the hardware vendors or people that work at hardware vendors are working on new hardware that does stuff that the kernel isn't even thinking about right now, or the upstream kernel isn't thinking about right now, or so we like to think. But let's not forget about our 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 people that don't want any hardware offload at all. They just want software data plane support. All right, so. Because of some things that are coming up, the XDP, so let's cheer for that. Let's say yay. Yay. Yay, all right. Right, okay, so we want our driver to support this, but as, as was just pointed out, that's, that's non-trivial. You know, you could have a couple XDP operations that are supported, and you might not know that the rest aren't. Not only that, XDP redirect is a challenge. Uh, it took us, admittedly, a long time to get it right. And on top of that, um, going, redirecting from, uh, a Broadcom card to a Mellanox card, or a Mellanox card to a Netronome card, or a Netronome card to an Intel card, um, or any of the other, or to VETH, or any of the other, uh, there's a couple others too that I'm leaving out, apologies. Um, that's not necessarily easy, or is not necessarily going to work. It should work now, but it took a whole new set of operations, and it took what, a year? What do you think, Jesper? Or year to get it right. Okay, so this is a non-trivial effort to have XDP support. All right, so I'm going to bring up one that's a favorite of mine, and I know uh, folks at Mellanox uh, originated this. So this is like a, a really weird kind of obscure thing that does this dynamic interrupt moderation in software. Uh, lots of hardware used to have it, but the cool thing about this is you can actually have different interrupt coalescing rates for different queues. And actually the kernel just takes care, or the drivers take care of doing it for you. You don't have to think about it. Uh, this is a pretty cool feature, not that hard to implement, but probably not that widely used because it's only deployed in, I think, two, maybe three drivers. A historical perspective, like 15, 20 years ago, drivers did this by hand inside the drivers. Mm -hmm. So kind of what's, what's old is new again. And back then there was no multi-queue, right? It was just that we're just trying to do everything we could to save, save cycles. Um, all right, now here's where maybe some of you want to say boo. Boo. <laughs> okay. So, but this is 100% an important thing to a hardware vendor. Whether it's someone who actively comes to this community or not, there are tons of users of the DPDK. And there are tons of applications written on top. In fact, one of the things that struck me from the talk earlier today is that, you know, one advantage that XTP could have over this is you could chain these things together easily. There's right now not any, not probably not very many turnkey DPDK apps that you could chain together that could take over hardware and do this and pass it to each other. So that's a distinct advantage that XDP could have. But this, there's a huge, huge market for this from the hardware vendor perspective. And so, you know, when you have religion around XDP being, you know, the the one true way, it's hard when you go back home, so to speak. Um, not only that, you want to talk about the thing that right now whips us? It's that right there. So the vector support for pull mode drivers for DPDK, for those that don't know, um, although I haven't tried it with the new, I haven't seen how the bulking stuff helps. Um, but uh, right now, you look at like what a single core can drop. If you use a vector driver, you can dominate uh, anything else that's out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think that's an important thing for us to think about. I know uh, LXA has talked, I think, to you before about can we use SIMD instructions, could we do some of this? And there's infrastructure now in place in the kernel, right, to be able to say we're entering and we're exiting a spot. So I think this is something we have to think about re-implementing. But at the same time, we got this. And not only do we have it to think about it for x86, we need to think about it for ARM, um, anything else we want to implement it for. Um, so I think this is a, a target, a target that, that we need to, to shoot for. On top of that, in addition to you know offload via 
uh, ETH tool ntuple or CLS uh, flower. Now DBDK has this notion of offloading via what they call RTE flow. So it's another thing that spends a lot of, we spend a lot of time thinking about or we spend a lot of time implementing because there's a lot of people interested in it. Um, so it's a, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Let's put it that way. Um, and we know the kernel bypass with this audience is generally not preferred. And I know I don't prefer it either. But uh, there's not as many people that have uh, as much uh, concern about deployment or concern about some of the other the other things that we've, we've long been concerned about with kernel bypass. So instead of that, we of course have our new, our new friend AFXDP. It's uh, maybe not that new anymore, um, although it's still got limited hardware support. I think there's only a couple drivers that support it. Uh, I have patches that make it work. Uh, I got some, some coaching on them uh, earlier uh, this year, and they'll go upstream at some point. Um, and, and I think maybe to steal a line from uh, Jesse Brandenburg from a few years ago, I think AFXDP is the new black. It is the new popular. There are going to be DPDK drivers that use AFXDP uh, as the bottom end. <clears throat> so a universal, the, the dream of a universal Polmo driver is pretty cool, I think. Uh, so I think that's, that's a pretty fun thing that's coming up. So as you can see, it seems really simple to make the best NIC, right? <laughs> like best for everybody. This is super, super easy task. Um, so, so what should we set as our goal? It's kind of as I think about, um, maybe I don't want to invite audience participation, but what should be a goal of a NIC vendor? What do you think? Anybody want to throw anything out? Anyone? Quality. Quality. Okay. What, so, okay. <laughs> so like not crashing the firmware or? That would be good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry. Anything else? Anything cool? Profit. Well, well, I mean, so. So, yeah, I mean, open source the firmware. I mean, I like to, like, not think too much. I mean, I joked about, you know, we want to sell the most NICs. But, yeah, it's, it, like, I try not to think too much about the corporate side of it uh, in this environment, although I guess that's what this talk's about. Um, well, so my personal opinion is that we want to minimize the number of, like, CPU instructions needed to process every packet, sort of on average. I know that sounds, like, sort of nonsensical or, like, obvious or either. Those are contradictory terms. But anyway... I think it's important to think about that. And I think until we started to see what was possible with XDP and maybe what was possible with um, the, some DPDK and some of the vector mode drivers, um, it's important to think about, about that. So what saves instructions? Well, offloading directly to hardware, you know, whether it's tunnel end cap or any of those other things I mentioned on that one eye chart slide that I had. I noticed I only had one. Um, offloading to hardware saves instructions. Optimizing drivers also saves instructions. Uh, if you watch some of the kernel commits, you can watch the evolution of some of the drivers, and you'll see people point out how I made these four changes, and now look at how much better, how much quick, more quickly I can drop packets uh, using an, a, an XDP test, for example. My favorite of all benchmarks. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, um, and XDP saves instructions, right? So. We know that over the traditional kernel stack, uh, if we want to perform some operations, uh, XDP is way faster than NetFilter for dropping packets. Um, although I'm going to say that, hopefully Pablo is not here. Um, and we know that AFXDP will ultimately save instructions as well, uh, especially relative to standard socket apps. Um, so, so I think that that's needs to be at the core of what we think about. And as the users are using them and deploying them, we need, they need to think about, you know, what do I really want to do? And of course, our good friend, the DPDK, saves instructions as well. Uh, so all these things are important. Data centers. Hmm? It's a great way to heat data centers. It, it is. It is. Um, so I think the reminder that I'm sort of stuck with every day, when we, we bounce, or every week or every month as we bounce between different people wanting to do solutions, is that there isn't a single hardware, firmware, driver combo that works for everybody. And, and so I guess the question is, should we focus on everything? And um, that's supposed to be funny. You can laugh. There we go. There we go. Um, so because I think this isn't possible, um, obviously, uh, not with a single person or not with 10 people. You just you, you fundamentally can't do it. Um, we know this isn't a realistic goal, but uh, it's still what we end up thinking about. So, so we think about how we can help users today. You know, what, what can we do? We can make firmware that's stable, that doesn't crash. We can you know, think about open sourcing it. We can try to support as many of the data plane things that exist. Because right now, 
what we have is, is you want to be a part of interesting potential markets or interesting potential solutions, which I think we try to do. Um, and then we think about how we want to enable future users. You know, we look at, um, didn't mention this before, but you look at things like what's happening occasionally. If you feel like it, you can look at what's happening at IETF and look at what upcoming standards might be, might, might hit a draft. What are some of the trends? Can we put some of that into hardware if people want? Um, or can we make the hardware get out of the way? Which do we need to do? And that's it. Thank you for your presentation. Let's start the q and I'm sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Nice try. <laughs> you tried that trick before. I did, yeah. <laughs> um, you've got to support a lot of things that, you know, last, what, 15, 20 years. We've had all of these new features coming up, and it must be an immense amount of work to try and maintain all of them. Um, and, and you're doing new features, and you still have to make sure that it works with all the other things. Do any of the new technologies allow you to re-implement and get rid of the legacy implementation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'm sorry. We, we no, had, no. I, 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 if, you, if you were at Pablo's NetFilter hardware offload, you kind of got the hint that we have certain elements of the hardware that are programmed via different avenues of configuration, like the... ETH tool RX filter thing versus the class flower thing. Mm -hmm. And if you configure here, does should it show up there? We have all this duplicated stuff unnecessarily. It has unclear semantics what you should do when you configure in both directions. And we have a lot of cruft sitting around. And it is a very good question of where we, can we get some of, rid of it? Yeah, I think from a pure hardware standpoint, if it, in the context of that, I think that if there was silicon, if there was space needed, you know, on the silicon for some new feature. There's always a chance we could look at, you know, one of these features and say, you know what, no one's really using that. If we can save the space, maybe we take it off. But I think by and large, um, there's often not an interest in removing hard, too many hardware features. It, it was less removing it than re You have a bunch of new technologies that are about filtering, that are about trying to reduce instructions. Could you re-implement and get rid of the legacy implementations? Oh, yeah, we do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when we... The, the goal with a lot of them is to be back, or the goal is to be backwards compatible. But you know, the, in, throughout the different generations of our chips, you know, there, there's key pieces that are re-implemented, um, and and the old implementation sort of tossed out in favor of a hopefully a new, better one that's deeper into the packet or allows more, you know, capabilities. I'm just curious. On this slide, you have uh, TSO, GSO, LRO, hardware, GRO. UFO. Um, those, some of those seem to me like software features in the core stack as opposed to having to do anything with the driver. The problem is that the hardware has to segment things at, at the boundaries properly in the buffering layer in order for hardware GRO to work. It's not a purely software thing. Like you have to segment the thing so that you can reconstitute precisely what came on the wire out and the only way to do that is to have the buffering parse the hardware and, and segment at the MSSs properly. So straight GRO, 100% right. 100% software, yes. Yes, 100% software. But in the hardware GRO case, they're actually able to put together in, with one call, we're able to pass up basically a, a frame that looks like software. What the software what GRO would have constructed. Would, would have constructed. What, right. What's the difference between LRO and hardware GRO? LRO is just one big super pocket with no restrictions yeah. on the segmentation, so therefore you can't, re, you can't reconstitute exactly what came in on the wire. It's, it's a violation. That's why we don't like people to use LRO. So if you get like, like say you get like 16K, there might be, you might get four pages in a row, like 16K of just raw data. And that Instead might Instead of 1448, 1448, 1448. Right. Does that make sense? No, more relaxed rules when you aggregate the case for LRO. Why in general is more. So is that one of the cases where we could get rid of LRO? Or does it have a use case? I mean, some cards don't do hardware GRO, and people want the performance and don't care about the violation of semantics. Yeah. Right. Especially when you terminate the flows, you mean. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. All right, here it comes. All right. 
So I just because you're talking about a continuum here, right? And on one side, I think you have sort of what I would consider the standard offloads, like checksum, checksum offload, for example. And then on the other side, you have some more of the NPU-like features where it's difficult to think about it in terms of like a traditional silicon implementation, uh, such as like VPF offload, right? Um, and I would say somewhere in the middle is like uh, the more flexible TCAM operations or flexible parsing support, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I would argue that we've never actually supported that very well in Linux. Um, You're right. So where does that fit in your in your sort of mental model of all these things? Is it? Well, uh, I think in I can speak from our case. You know, we take that TCAM and use it. Uh, in a way that sort of looks very fixed function in the way we do our flow offload. And it's moderately disappointing uh, because it's not nearly as efficient as it could be. Um, I mean, I think it would be nice to see that, but it also, I, I mean, and I think you've experienced this too, it's a struggle to represent that in a generic programmatic way. And, and so what I have, in my experience, what you end up having then is proprietary solutions that you sell to very specific people and the Linux open source world never sees these solutions. Yep. And uh, maybe that's a, a problem. Right. I think it is. I mean, I, I think it is for, you know, precisely because, and maybe this is intentional, but for the folks that receive those, you know, now have, you know, less eyes looking at it, but also maybe have a little bit of an advantage. Maybe that's... Uh, this would be the last question. I think that's how much time we have. So right. I, I just think this is a curious situation where actually the hardware is more uh, flexible than the software model we have for it. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you very much, Andy. <laughs>